Doc, tell me about um, your interest in becoming a veterinarian. So I wanted to be a veterinarian since as long as I could remember. Um, I didn't think it was going to be a goal that I would be able to attain. You know, it's very competitive. I was a science major in college and I actually went to graduate school to get a PhD in the same uh, subject area that I went to undergrad for. And I just didn't find it very fulfilling for me. I was really not learning much more than I knew from my undergraduate days. And uh, I took a job working in research at a pharmaceutical company. And right across the hall was the veterinarian that was working for the, veter or for the drug company as well. And we talked and he's like, you should definitely apply. And so it just started the whole process again. And I applied and I was very, very, very lucky and surprised that I got in on my first try. You knew you wanted to do something with animals and, and help families with their pets. I, I did. And actually my research and my PhD program, I was working on animals and I was like, I don't, I don't think I can continue this for four or five years sacrificing animals for research. Although obviously the research is needed and valid, right. it just was not something that I felt comfortable doing for a period of time. So I went in the opposite direction. From one extreme to the other. Right. Tell us about uh, where you went to college, where you grew up. So I grew up right in Albany and I went to college at the Philadelphia College of Pharmacy and Science. And I got my undergraduate degree in toxicology. And then I went to start my graduate school at University of Arizona in their PhD program in pharmacology. What keeps you in this area? You could be anywhere. You could be a veterinarian anywhere and with your travels around the world. What, what is your reason for staying around Albany? So I grew up here and my wife at the time also grew up here. Our family is here. Uh, my last year of veterinary school, we became pregnant and we just decided that we really wanted to be back and be where our family was to raise our, our children. And so we moved back home. Um, most veterinarians are happy with the practice. Your practice here at Burn Hills now, you have multiple things going on in all different directions. Mm -hmm. But you have a practice here at Burn Hills, and yet you're able to be able to do so much more mm -hmm. at the state level, national level, international level. How do you do that? So there's a little bit of a juggle at times. I, I'm really lucky that Burn Hills is very flexible with me, and so, for instance, when I went to the Ukraine, I had to cancel my appointments. They understood. They actually support my work. You know, I'm, I get my supplies, vaccines, anything that I need to take with me when I'm going abroad. They let me get it all through their the hospital. So they're incredibly supportive. Um, it's a it's a little tiring at times to have multiple jobs, but I love what I do, and I love working here. I love the people that I work with. And I love my clients. I've been here since 1995, so I have a group of people that I take care of, that I've taken care of usually for their animals' entire lives in many cases. So you just have a tight bond with people. I can tell, I can tell that means a lot to you. It's almost like an extension of your family, I'm sure, right. when you see these people every day or mm -hmm. every year with their pets. Agreed. Mm. Um, what's your driving force? What drives you to do so much? You know, that's, it's hard to say. I, I think for as long as I can remember, since my kids were you know, a little bit older and more self-sufficient, I would just, I see things that there's a need for. So for instance, I was getting my master's in public health and I uh, finished, I think in 2008 at uh, University of Albany. One of my classes, I had to go out into the community and get literature on HIV prevention because it was a class on HIV. And I was, went to the Albany Damien Center and I was looking for literature and I saw that they had a pet support program to help people living with HIV and AIDS. And I, I met the director at the time, we talked, he explained all about the program and I walked away and I thought, I wonder if I can do something to help this program be even more than it is right now. At that point, they were providing in-home care for people that were too sick to care for their animals, giving vouchers to go to the veterinarian for veterinary care, giving out food and supplies. And so I thought about it for a little bit and I got back in touch with the Damien Center and I said, what if we set up wellness clinics? Because I'm pretty sure I can get donations of vaccines and heartworm prevention and things like that. Then we can take the financial burden off of people because one of the reasons 
that people have to relinquish their pet is that there's obviously a financial burden. Mm -hmm. And if we're not keeping pets healthy that are living with people that are immunocompromised, then we're also producing a risk to their health as well. So they were on board. I joined, um, I joined the committee, the advisory committee for the PAUSE Pets Are Wonderful support program. And we worked together and we formulated this wellness clinics and I roped in some of my friends that were veterinarians or veterinary technicians and we started doing it. And, and I have to tell you that it's probably been one of the most fulfilling things that I've done in my professional life because you could see how important an animal is. If, if you're isolated from your family or your friends because you've been given a diagnosis and all you have is an animal and then I'm able in some small way to help that relationship, that was just like a tremendous feeling of I'm really using my education to the best that I can, can do. I can see the passion when you, I was gonna to talk to you about that a little bit later, but I can see your passion for, for helping the Damien Center mm -hmm. and uh, making life better for people. Both, and, and both their pets. people and pets. Right, and, and you know, what we found was that when people had pets and the pets were being well cared for, the individuals were more compliant with their medication schedules as well, and they were staying healthier. So it was just sort of a win-win all the way around. And the people at the Damien Center are also phenomenal people and very passionate and committed to helping people, you know, people that other other people may not look upon favorably, unfortunately, right. because of stigma around a diagnosis. Well, it gives them a reason to, to get well and mm -hmm. stay well. Um, tell me what the uh, the National Animal and Sheltering Coalition is. I know your secretary. Yes. What what does that organization do? So after Hurricane Katrina, there are multiple organizations in the United States that respond to disasters, but the effort during Hurricane Katrina was largely un unorganized and people were not communicating and it led to um, rescues not being successful because mm -hmm. animals were going where people didn't know where they were going so they couldn't reunite with them, etc. So many of the major players in the country came together and said, we need to work together. We all have our own goals and our own missions but we can work together and coordinate our efforts. And so that's where the National Animal Rescue and Sheltering Coalition came into play. So there's many members, it includes the Red Cross, ASPCA, International Fund for Animal Welfare, PetSmart Charities, so many more that I, I can't get. <laughs> so anytime there's some kind of disaster, mm -hmm. could be wildfires, could be a flood, could be a bad hurricane, you guys all work as a team yeah. so, to make sure things are done right, to, to save pets and to help families and their animals. Absolutely. So there, we have coordination calls every night during a disaster, whether it's a wildfire in, in California or it's floods down south because of hurricanes. And so we're all coordinating our efforts. So we know ASPCA has this equipment and this number of personnel on the ground and they're in this parish and they're working. And then... Uh, American Humane can go and say we're going to go over here and we're going to be you know manning this shelter or setting up temporary shelter here so it's just a, a, a much better organized arena than it was during Hurricane Katrina and you know one of the positive outcomes of this group coming together is that they're recognized at the national level by the federal government now and so what they're doing to meet the needs of animals during disasters is recognized and so FEMA understands the importance of it because these groups are championing right. why is this so important you know we have to help animals during disasters you can't have a disaster that's affecting a human being that's not also affecting and think about population. this right how many people will not evacuate it's, it's if, they, actually, if they can't take their pets with them. It's the number one reason people refuse to evacuate. Study after study has shown that, that if you have not provided a, a way for you to take care of your animal and evacuate, people are going to stay home. And then that has unintended consequences right. as well because now you're putting first responders at greater risk because people are in their homes, it's flooded, it's harder to get them out. And so it's sort of a, a cascade effect. Right. And, and, so, and I would imagine that right first responders are at risk and some of those families 
perish because they refuse and to leave. Definitely, would refuse to leave their animals. Home. Definitely, and there's sometimes there's naysayers. Why are you Why are you there helping animals when people are in need? Well, it's a matter of human safety because if we're not taking care of the animals, the people aren't leaving, and it just everyone's going to be harmed. So, mm. amazing. That was just. Page one. <laughs> we need to get to the. I'm a talker, I find it slow, but I, but I, I sound. It's so fascinating. Yeah, I mean, you're giving such great, great uh, insight. All right, now we're going to go into the international stuff. Um, how do you make the leap from being involved nationally and obviously locally here at Burn Hills mm -hmm. as a veterinarian? How do you make that leap to helping during disasters internationally? So it, it kind of comes back to my role at the National Animal Rescue and Sheltering Coalition because the International Fund for Animal Welfare, or IFA, is one of the members. And so part of, we, would, we have meetings every quarter, in-person meetings somewhere in the country where we get together. Um, and so everyone gives a, an update on their agency. And they would talk about, oh, you know, we're in this country taking care of this, or there's a hurricane in this area and we're doing that. And I, you know, I became friends with those people. It's not a large group at the level that's coordinating. And I, I would just say, that is absolutely fascinating what you're doing. I would love to be involved. And then soon after that, the hurricane that occurred in the Philippines in 2013, I got a call from my colleagues and they said, we think that you would be really helpful and we'd like you to come over to the Philippines and assist us in our mission there. And I jumped at it. My family was a little bit <laughs> less enthusiastic about traveling to a, a country that's literally been decimated right. by a natural disaster um, and not really knowing what I was getting into or going well, into. Well, that was your first trip. That was my first trip. Tell us what you did in the Philippines because what you did was, I mean, it was such a necessity because of so many dogs and cats and people being in close quarters. Right. So. We went from um, different areas of the country. Most people are living in the coastal areas, and so their homes, which were not much to begin with, unfortunately, because poverty is so prevalent there, they're mostly you know plywood shacks or cardboard houses right there on the beach. They were all destroyed, so people got had to congregate in even closer quarters. Animals are prevalent there. There were dogs everywhere. They're not vaccinated. Rabies is an endemic disease in the country. Now we've compressed animals and people together and we've heightened the risk of mm -hmm. rabies transmission through dog bites. So one of the, the core missions that we did on that trip was to go to neighborhood to neighborhood in these affected areas and do vaccine clinics, um, vaccinate the dogs for rabies, dogs and cats, and also to give out pet supplies, pet food to help support them. And we also gave out things for the people as well. Um, and that really brings a smile to my face because uh, just the kids would line up when our van pulled up. And they, you know, they're, they're living in these horrendous situations. And just to get a coloring book and crayons put such a smile on their face. And it made them so happy. It, you can't help but feel good. Well, I can, see, I can see you smiling. So obviously to hit you at home of how important it, it is for those simple things that we don't think as much, but they right. think it's like the but, best thing ever. And and to go back to that time, there was no power in, in the country. There was no electricity. There was no running water. There was no food. There, you know, there, there's no refrigeration, so there's no, no way to keep food mm. fresh. And, and I, when I was reviewing the pictures, um, that I was giving to you guys, I can remember every single encounter I had still to this day, and it's been almost 10 years. And, and one of the things that strikes me so much is that these people have nothing, nothing. And they're still, you can't leave until I give you a bowl of rice or a cooked egg. Isn't I'm like, I, you know, I don't want it because you need it way more than I do. But they still want to give it to you. But they still want to give it to you. And, and so, you know, you would always have to have a little bit to be polite, but I'm always like, I, I don't want to take something when it's a scarce resource for you. It's amazing. Absolutely amazing. Now, what happened in Lebanon? Was that, <clears throat> was that your second trip, Lebanon? My second trip with IFA, yes. And what was, what was going over there that, that they needed your help? So the Syrian refugee crisis was in full effect at that time, and there were millions of people that were migrating into so Lebanon. we're talking about a lot of refugees bringing mm -hmm. animals. Animals. Again, people don't travel without their animals for the most part. 
the, there's not a lot of infrastructure within Lebanon to, to handle that. Um, they were quickly overwhelmed. They ran out of space and shelters. You know, people, if you're struggling to find housing and you can't keep a pet, then you're going to get rid of it. And a lot of times that means just leave it on the street. Uh, so we went over, there's a group there called Animals Lebanon located in Beirut. And so we went over to um, do a few things. One, I went over as a veterinarian to provide some medical care for some of the animals and to help augment what they were already doing. And then we brought animals back to the United States and Canada to relieve some of the burden that was on the, on the infrastructure, on the shelter infrastructure in that country. Now you brought dogs and cats back mm -hmm. and I believe they ended up at the Mohawk Hudson. Humane Society, a lot of them? Uh, many of the cats have, yes. Many of the cats yep. ended up there. And yep, they've been a great partner to me. It's, it's got to bring your, your work at, at another level. Not only are you uh, you're helping this country out that's overwhelmed, but then you get to bring some back with you. And then they get adopted and bring a family happiness that mm -hmm. they might not have otherwise known without adopting that pet. It almost goes full circle. It does, and sometimes people will question, why are you bringing animals back to the United States? We have an overpopulation here, right? right. I, I never bring an animal back unless there's a space for it to go to ahead of time. And it's, it's a win-win situation all the way around if you take a step back and look at it, because for the group in Lebanon, for their shelters full, they're at capacity, right? They're fundraising to continue their operation. When they see that 25 cats <laughs> are leaving Beirut for a new home in the United States where they're going to be appropriately cared for and loved, that's like a huge, a huge deal for everyone involved. It's a huge deal for the volunteers of that organization. It must be so uplifting to it them. Is. They, and they, they see, wow, this is a big deal. This is important. <laughs> And on the day that we leave, there's, it's always frenzied activity. You know, we're assembling carriers for 25 cats and arranging transportation to the airport. And someone has to always go to the airport, make sure they didn't switch out the aircraft, um, which would prohibit live animals. And it's, it's just wonderful to see all these people working together. And everyone is so happy that these animals are getting yeah. home. It's, it's great. And that is amazing. And they want to know what happens to them after they come here. So I often have to go back to Mohawk Cuts and, and take pictures of them in the shelter and to show, show them them. that they're being appropriately cared for here. And then they get adopted. And they're getting adopted. And the rest is, have you ever had one that was adopted come to your practice? That would be kind um, of cool. So, yeah, I have my own dog, came from Lebanon, oh Habib. Goodness. I was going to ask you that. Mm -hmm. what you had for so, so he came in one of our rescue transports, and I wasn't meant to keep him. Um, he has deformed limbs, and he was really weak, and the other dogs would knock him over. And, mm -hmm. and I thought, I just I can't ask someone else to take on this burden. And my two dogs at the time were fine with him, so I said, you, you have a home, and you can stay here. So can I ask you a question? Well, you were foster failure then? Um, uh, yeah, but like I was a failure in 24 hours, so I don't, I don't know if that counts. <laughs> you knew it was going to be a match, right? <laughs> right? Um, and one of the other uh, dogs I brought back, um, unfortunately, was shot in its, in its face, right through its right eye. And one of my friends adopted that dog. And unfortunately, animal abuse is, is quite prevalent in the country. Um, and so there was another dog, Chippy, who was beaten by kids in the street, and they broke all four of his legs. And he was, he did have surgery in Lebanon. Unfortunately, they have limited resources sometimes. So the surgery was done, but it wasn't done correctly. And the pins that they used to fix his back legs were actually sticking into his joint. And so he couldn't take a step and be comfortable. And so he came back with me underneath the seat of the airplane. And my friend and coworker at my state job adopted him on the spot, loves him to pieces. She got the surgery, got the pins out, he's walking, he's happy. So that's the stuff that make you realize that you're making a difference. Absolutely, and, and these dogs now have... Great homes. Great homes and a great life. Mm -hmm. um, let's talk about your latest trip. Mm -hmm. um, and again, uh, we see it on TV and social media <clears throat> of what's happening in Ukraine the millions of people leaving. Mm -hmm. You were located, you decided, again, the rescue effort to go to Poland, mm -hmm. where the vast majority of refugees from Ukraine in the war 
were heading with their pets, right? Correct. Tell me what your first impression was when you got there. It must have been... Now, when did you go? How long were you there? Uh, I was there for about two weeks, so I left on March 29th, and I came back on the 10th or 12th of April. <sighs> I, I can't imagine when they're talking about hundreds of thousands of people every day coming over the border just with, with nothing. What was it like just to see this, to see right. what was going on? So to be honest, I had no expectations because I had very limited contact with the organizers at IFA. You know, I basically got, they said, here's your plane ticket. And I said, well, how do I get from Krakow to the border? And I was Google, you know, and I was seeing I had to take two buses and a train and um, finally, I figured out I could just take one train, so it took four hours to get from Krakow to the town, and then someone from my flat picked me up, and she said, I have bad news and good news. The good news is that you arrived safely. The bad news is that you're going to work tonight, and you're going to work overnight shifts, and we're going to sleep in the tent. And I was like, okay. That's, I'm, 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 that's I'm, why you were there, right? Already, right? And it, it's freezing cold, and so I didn't know what was going on at the border, but... The way it was set up, um, the border crossing was right there. So, How close were you actually to the border, right? 100, at the, like 100 feet. What town was it in in Poland? Premisil. And I, I, I forget my pronunciation because it's pronounced differently by different, in right. different languages, but it was Premisil. So it was the Medica boarding cross, crossing is where we were at. So I got there and Jen, my colleague from IFA, said... This is the way it is. It's going to look at times like almost like a circus. It, there's a lot going on. And so there, it's about a quarter mile from the border processing area to where um, evacuees get onto buses to go to the next leg of their journey. Um, and it's that whole quarter mile is lined with humanitarian groups from all over the world. So, you know, people from Israel, people from Egypt, people from France. Uh, and so we had a tent set up, and about 25 or 30 percent of the people that were evacuating were doing so with animals. And a lot of people left rather precipitously, of course, and they didn't have the proper supplies or the proper carriers for their animals. So we would kind of get them to come into our tent for IFA. So you had a tent for just animal care? Just for animal care. And how many veterinarians were there? I mean, I'm um, sure you had assistants and helpers there too. Yeah, so when I first started, it was me and one other veterinarian. And then after a few days, a third veterinarian came. So we went from 12 to 14 hour shifts to more like eight to 10 hour shifts. And I, since I started at night, I just kept the overnight shift for the entire time. But it was, you were on the front lines with, I'm sure, hundreds of pets coming in at I mean, in, hopefully most of them were in, in good shape. I'm sure some needed some yeah. medical help. What, what was it like to see people that lost everything? They lost family members, they lost their home. All they would had with them is what they could carry. And one of those things would be their pet. Mm -hmm. what, what, was, what was that like? And that's really when that, the whole situation hit me. You know, I just had gotten there. The very first person that we helped was had a cat in a broken plastic carrier she, and she was pulling a suitcase maybe she was 55 years old by herself she could speak a little bit of english and we got her in the tent we got the cat put in a new carrier we actually in our tent we had a little area where we had set up the cats could get out of the carrier and relieve themselves use a litter box mm -hmm. get a bite to eat you know have 20 30 minutes just to relax for a moment um so after that, we got the cat in a carrier. I said, you know, hey, I'll bring your suitcase up to where the buses are because it was heavy. So we're walking and I, I said, you know, do you want me to stop and get you something to eat or coffee from one of the humanitarian groups that was lining the path? And, and she looked at me and she said, I'm too tired to even think about eating. And then I realized this woman's whole life is in this purple suitcase, right? She's left her family behind. She's left her house behind. And... I said, well, where are you going? Where? And she said, I don't have any idea where I'm going. That's and that's when it, I'm like, your, your life is destroyed. You're carrying one suitcase of belongings and your cat, and you don't even know where you're gonna end up mm. for the remainder of this conflict. And so that's, that really brought the, the issue home. And then 
it was a steady stream of people 24 seven. And you know, it's mostly women and children because men between the ages of 18 and 60 can't leave the country. Right. And uh, it, it was great to be able to help them. I can tell you that I did not see a single person that was not appreciative and said, you know, thank you in whatever language they were speaking, whether it was, was Russian or Ukrainian. With, with the language barrier, it must have been difficult at times. I'm sure you had, yeah. probably had some translators trying to help you, but it, it, it must have made it a little bit more challenging to know exactly what their needs would be. Yeah, in the beginning, um, I did not, we did not have translators. And so for the first two nights, it was my phone and Google Translate and, you know, speak into it, then I speak into it. We try to figure out and point to what you need. Um, after a couple days, and, and this is one of the things I really admire and, and like about IFA, they hired Ukrainian high school students that were displaced to be our interpreters. And so my interpreter was Leo, he was 17. His mother and father were still in Ukraine. His dad was a sailor, he couldn't leave. His mom worked at the port. They sent him out of the country for safety. He's 17 on his own in Poland. You know, he doesn't know where he's doesn't going. Doesn't know his soul, doesn't, doesn't know, know what the soul. outcome's going to be. But he was friends with these other students that got hired as translators, so he got hired too. So it was him and I every night. And uh, I, don't, I don't have the maturity at, at my age to conduct myself like this young man conducted himself. You know, his family is in peril and he's here helping. He doesn't even know if his parents are gonna be alive. No, he doesn't, he doesn't. And uh, not only did he help me, but he put himself outside our tent, 20, you know, the, our entire shift, just answering questions for people that came across the border because, you know, a lot of volunteers are from all over the world. There's everyone speaking a different language. Right. It's like the land of Babel. Um, and he was there just to help everybody in any way that he could, whether it was with an animal or tell him where to go to get food, or this is the tent you go to to get diapers and formula. So it was amazing. And all of, all of our translators were the same. And I, I would think about it. I'm like, here, these kids are seniors in high school, right? And think about how traumatic it is when we're in America and we're leaving for college. Right. These kids are without their parents. Their homes are, are destroyed in some cases. They're on their own. And they don't know what happened to their family. Right, and, or, or what's next for them, or how they're gonna get there. And, and there they are, working, professional, kind. Just, it, it was just, that was one of the highlights for me. And I, I still talk to my translator, Leo, every day, every other day. We're still in touch, yeah. You become um, a friend now. Yeah, he had, yeah. Maybe like, someday he'll come here and I and have extended you. the offer to him. How did the families get their pets out of the war zone. Everything we saw on TV, it was just, okay, you had some shuttles, you had some buses, and then you would just see lines and lines of people, mm -hmm. like you said, dragging whatever they had, and you would see them, a dog on a leash, walking miles and miles. Is that literally how they did it? It was literally how they did it. You know, some people did arrive on a bus, but many people had been traveling for days just on foot. They were exhausted. The animals were absolutely exhausted. And, you know, a lot of them left with anything that they could put their animal in. And I saw all kinds of things. I, uh, a young man had a bird in his coat for days. He had been traveling with a bird stuck inside his coat. There was a mouse in a, a takeout food container. Um, there were turtles, there were snails. Um, I think some of the sadder ones, I, there was a cat where someone had taken a plastic storage box and duct taped it shut with the cat inside and just poked holes in it. Mm. And it was so tight that the cat couldn't lift its head up mm. at all and it, had, it was urine soaked and it was incredibly stressed. And so to be able to just get the cat out Put it over here, let it rest, let it eat. It was amazing. And give them a new carrier. And then just the smiles on people's faces. It was it was amazing. And you know, we gave we gave them food, we triaged them for medical care, we gave them leashes, we gave them harnesses, portable bowls, whatever they yeah, needed that, to continue and, on. And that meant the world to them. Mm -hmm. I mean they they just left everything. Mm -hmm. And their pet, for some of them, was their whole life. Mm -hmm. That's what they wanted. That's what they felt so important to bring with them. Mm -hmm. They're no different than us with our pets. They're, they're part of the family. I think, you know, one of the, the, saddest, the saddest nights that we had there 
it was probably 10 or 11 o'clock. We were changing shifts and uh, two, two women, a, a young girl, 18 or 19, came in with her mom. She was okay until she walked in the tent. She had three carriers with her and she just started shaking and sobbing. And uh, someone, one of our volunteers who didn't even speak Ukrainian, just went up and hugged her and held her. And then an interpreter came and said, well, you know, what's going on? Why are you so upset? And she said, my house was bombed and burned. Mm -hmm. The only thing that we could get out were our seven cats and a backpack. That's all that they had. And her mom took a piece of the bomb out and showed us. And that's not even the worst part of the story. She said, I have somewhere to go, but I can only take one of these seven cats and I have to pick one cat to go with oh me. Oh my God. And again, sobbing, and she just grabbed a cat and we put it in a carrier and she left. And the, the group did work the next day to try to find a placement that would take all of the cats with her. Um, but unfortunately at that point, you know, she had already made this mental decision as, as devastating as it was for her. And then facing this unknown future, wh how am I going to manage traveling to another country with seven cats and care for seven cats? You know, right. so she committed to that. I had to give them up. And so she stuck with it. Um, but on the bright side of that horrible situation, those cats came back to the hotel where people were staying, our volunteers were staying, and they all ended up in a loving home. Isn't and it went all over the world. So one went that to That is Finland. absolutely amazing. Yeah. Oh, it, it, again, it comes full circle. And wow, that's. And you, you wish she would know that that happened to her six right. it's, it's too bad she didn't. We did that. assure her that the cats would be appropriately cared for and would be placed in, in homes. Um, and so I think she did have she, that she knowledge. She felt good that they were right, a little okay. bit of, a little bit of satisfaction um, for her. The people that came over, um, their faces must be etched in your mind. The look of fear, the confusion. Um, some of them probably were not in good physical shape. I'm sure a lot of elderly. Mm -hmm. People might have been injured and hurt along the way. We had I mean, a man pass out right in front of our tent an elderly man who had been walking for days and just collapsed right on the ground in front of our tent. It was must absolutely be things horrible. That just, things that you saw that you just probably never seen before in your life and mm -hmm. you hope you never do again mm -hmm. um, that will always stick with you. For yeah. sure. For sure. I, I think just you know, real, the realization of what these people were going through was, was really what sticks with me and I, I can't get it out of my mind even now when I read the news every day about where there's a new bombing or missile strike. And I, I know what that means, you know, and there's going to be more people that are leaving. Our group, IFAW, did not cross over the border and go into the Ukraine, but they did support the other organizations that were there doing that. And so we had a, a man from Germany who was associated with our tent uh, and he would go over to Kiev every couple of days, despite the fact that he's, he very well is Could not going to make it back. And I right. asked him, I, I said, Jan, like, are you, are you not afraid to do it? Because that's when they were on the outskirts attacking right. Kiev yep. and people were dying all over the place mm -hmm. around there. And he was, he's also a paramedic, so he had a, a truck that looked like an ambulance and he just would say, I hope they're going to respect that I'm in a medical vehicle and right. not do anything. But there were so many animals that were also left behind. Not everybody was able to take their animals. And, and he explained, you know, it's, it's devastating to see because there's animals in apartment buildings, but no one can rescue them because there's still live mortar rounds in the apartment building. So you know that there's animals in need, you but you can't going. do anything. But there's also people in need, which is just yeah. even more horrendous. You know, elderly people were not able to travel like other people were able to travel. Do you plan on going back there again if, if needed? So I, I did volunteer to go back. However, they're transitioning. IFA is transitioning. And again, this is a great thing. They've worked with the Polish authorities to be able to take displaced Ukrainian veterinarians and give them a job. And so they're taking Isn't over. That wonderful? Our, you know, what we were manning. So this way, you know, the services are still being provided, but they're also providing a living for these people that are not able to make a living in other ways. But you guys, IFOS started that. I mean, you right. guys started that so this can continue with the Ukrainian veterinarians. And IFOS will continue to support them financially. So they were 
giving grants to the Polish authorities that were taking care of animals that had greater medical needs that we couldn't handle at the tent. They were um, getting food and supplies and getting it pushed back into the Ukraine to help people. It, it was amazing because we would get sometimes a day ahead of time saying, we have a hundred pound dog coming through, it's gonna need a crate, or we have a pregnant dog coming through that's about to give birth. So the group in the tent could prepare go out, get an appropriate size crate for that dog so they could travel, get whatever is needed for the, you know, the pregnant dog, a quiet place for her to, to hang out and be able to deliver a right. puppy. So a lot of communication back and forth from the people that did go over. Now, a lot of people have asked me about different uh, rescue organizations and ways, you know, there's, we know so many great humanitarian groups are, are there, uh, but there are so many pet lovers that feel like, who should we help? Mm -hmm. Who could use our help the most? Tell us about IFA. That's the one that, that you've worked with. You know them the best. Mm -hmm. That's an organization that can use as much support as anyone can give because they're, they're right there right now. Right. And and I, that's what I tell people, you know, I would support that organization because I saw their work and I know what they're doing. And I know that they're, they're using donations rationally and, and wisely. And their philosophy is cash is what's best because they take the, the money that people donate, they buy all the supplies locally. So all the pet food, all the crates, all the leashes, everything was bought locally in the community in Poland. And so that way you're still keeping a local economy going, you're keeping money in right. the country. People wanna send stuff and I, I admire that, but when you're on the ground and you're getting you know truckloads of stuff that you didn't ask for and you don't necessarily know what to do with, it makes it that can be a disaster in itself, right? Because you have to manage cash. That. You can you can target Okay, today we need to get harnesses or exactly. leashes for medium dogs or small dogs right. or cat carriers, which right. a lot of people didn't have when they crossed exactly. the border. Tell us what IFOS stands for. It stands for the International Fund for Animal Welfare. And their Disaster Response Division, which is what I was deploying with, is just one aspect of that organization. Their, their effects are, are wide ranging, and I would encourage people to go to their website, ifa.org, and find out more about the organization if you're thinking about donating. But the work that they do is profound, and it's not just for disaster response. I, uh, I did go to the website, and uh it's amazing what they have on there right now about what's going on in, mm -hmm. in Ukraine. And they make it so easy for people to donate. And uh, we'll include this as part of, part of the story so people can donate. We'll, we'll be all over our social media on the TV as well. I, I know you don't like recognition. Uh, it's like pulling teeth. Right. So I'm glad we've been able to meet. 2018, I remember this. You were given the American Humane Hero Award for veterinarians. You were recognized for your work in 2018 mm -hmm. on a national level. Um, and again, I know you don't like the accolades, but there must be a, some feeling of reward that people are recognizing what you're doing. Because what you're doing, most veterinarians don't do. I mean. It's hard enough running a practice, hard right. enough being a, a veterinarian at a practice, but you're doing, you're, you're all over the place. It must have been very gratifying to be recognized. It was, it was humbling as well as gratifying. I, you know, it was, uh, there were other people up for that award. I ultimately was selected for it, but every single person that was selected was doing something fantastic amazing, right? and amazing with the, with the profession. And so, you know, a little bit embarrassed to receive the award because I thought everybody deserved the award. Really. Right, you would give it, everybody right. should get one. Everyone right? should have got that. Um, but it, it was probably the most important thing that's happened to me in my professional career. And, and although I don't like the attention, I am very, very proud that I received that award. And, and I was you should recognized. be, you should be, because you just go above and beyond the call of duty as a, as a veterinarian and, and then some. Thank you. Um, I know we mentioned this earlier, what do you have for pets? Um, right now I have two dogs. I have my dog Habib that came from Beirut, and then I yeah. have a rescue lab Maya that came from uh, one of our local rescues here, Canine Good, Canine Good Shepherd. 
So they must have a great life with you. Um, I like to think they have a great life. I tell them that every day before I leave for work. Um, I hope they appreciate the life that they have. Uh, and they taught you some tricks. They're probably teaching you. I always say, pets have a way of training us before we train them. You know, I, my dog Habib has been a bit of a challenge. I, I, I don't like dogs that are aggressive or have issues with other dogs, and he has all of those. So he has unfortunately nipped workers in my house and things, but I think we've gotten him to a point where he directs his aggression to toys and not to people anymore. Um, if okay, he but he had such a tough... He had a, he tough had a really tough life. He, he did. And he lives for food. And unfortunately, he's become obese despite my best efforts. So it's a little bit embarrassing. I, I did include a picture. It was back in his skinny days. So I won't show you what he but looks like. But he's fat now. and happy now. He's fat and happy now. There's nothing wrong with that. <laughs> um, if you weren't doing all this stuff, Mm -hmm. What is, what are your passions for like a hobby? Is there anything you do? do you, what do you do to occupy the little spare time that you have? Are you resting or thinking about your next journey or rescue that you'd be working on? I think, you know, to answer that, um, spending time with my friends and family is, is one of the most important things in my life. And I love to travel. I love to go all over the world and to see different different parts of the world, to experience different cultures, to meet different people from other areas of the world. That's really, that is my passion. 